So you've seen thousands, thousands. of yeah. dead bodies that have been murdered. The fentanyl, like the proper um, powder, like fentanyl ink powder, the precursors to cook it come from China or from Germany. So you, you just totally immerse yourself into the narco culture to gain their trust, to experience it so you understand it better. Or boss brought someone from China to, to teach him how to cook this shit. I don't know if you um, heard about the killing of two employees of the U.S. consulate in Ciudad Juarez. So these are all hitmen coming in and all out hitmen, of there. Yeah, yeah. Because I know if I kill that guy or that couple of guys that got into me, there's going to be more coming. Um, so you're saying that the DEA is trading weapons for kingpins for kingpins Info. and you grab a kingpin he was just part of that horizontal structure he was not the boss you didn't cut the head of the snake Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Sean Ryan Show. This is episode 012, and it's all about cartels, the DEA, and fentanyl. Thank you for everyone that showed up to the live conference about the Blackwater episode. It was a great chat we had on Patreon, and for you patrons out there, you are the ones that make it possible to bring these stories to light. So thank you. If you can't support us on Patreon, please go to the link below, click the iTunes tab, and leave us a review. All we're looking for is one word. Let's get on to the cartel stuff. In episode 012, we've brought to you an investigative cartel journalist that was kidnapped. He also witnessed an arms deal go down between the DEA and the Sonola cartel. He's also embedded with fentanyl chemists in Mexico and discusses with us how the Chinese are sending chemists to Mexico to train the cartels to produce the most potent fentanyl in the world how it's smuggled into the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my next guest, Luis Chaparro. Luis Chaparro. Did I say that right? Yes, that's perfect. <laughs> Welcome to the Sean Ryan Show. Thank you for having me, man. I mean, um, I told you I w I've been binge watching your channel, and now I'm here. It's like, wow, this is yeah. this is where it happens. Second interview in the new studio. And this is an amazing studio, man. You have here. Thank like, you. I really love it. It's, Thank you. It's, it's, it's amazing. So you're an investigative reporter, and you do a lot of stuff with drug trafficking, narcos, and immigration. Yeah. And uh, we met on a Zoom call, mm -hmm. uh, you shot an email in and, and uh, said you wanted to be on the show. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of those emails and nine times out of 10, we nix them yeah. right <laughs> off the bat. But uh, you sent a couple of articles, we picked through them and I was like, shit, you know, let's see what this guy's all about. So, and we had just wrapped up a episode with my friend, Ed Calderon, yeah. which is what uh, drew you into the channel. Exactly. And I think we were all a little skeptical on, you know, well, what's going to make you different than Ed? Yeah. Because, you know, Ed, we had just done that. Ed's very knowledgeable on mm -hmm. all these topics. And uh, so we jumped on a Zoom call, first words out of your mouth after 
I think my wife asked you that is what's going to make you any different than Ed? You said, well, we just did a deal between the DEA mm -hmm. and the Sonola cartel. cartel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I jumped in immediately and said, fuck it, you're on. Let's, do it. Let's set a date. <laughs> and uh, so here you are. And um, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about arms trafficking, your DEA deal. And you did a tour of a fentanyl lab. Yeah. And um, then we'll get into the documentary that you made and produced uh, and eventually wound up on Showtime, on Showtime, correct? yes. So, which I watched this morning. It was, it was a good, uh, good doc. Thank you. So, <clears throat> but kind of getting a little backstory on you just a little bit here. How did you kind of get into investigative journalism when it comes to, you know, cartels? Well, I, I grew up in Juarez. I was born in, in Ciudad Juarez, right at the border um, of Mexico, right across El Paso, Texas. I have the dual citizenship. So growing up at the border, you are immediately immersed into that crazy world of cartels and all that stuff. It's been happening in Mexico forever. So I remember reading some um, magazines my dad used to read. My dad is a lawyer, but he used to be a teacher back then and he would like read a lot and I would read about cartels, I would read about organizations, about drug trafficking and it was like it blew my mind that that world existed in the same world I was living in. At the same time that culture is always around you when you're leaving a place like Ciudad Juarez. I was in, um, in, a, in a private school, in um, primary school uh, it was like a fancy school where most of the, you know, like businessman and business owner put uh, their kids. And the rumor that some of the narcos, including Amado uh, Carrillo Fuentes, El Señor de los Cielos, um, he had a couple of kids there on, the, on that same school. Um, so I was like, you know, the, the, the whole, my whole life has been around that stuff. So I wanted, I knew when I was in um, secondary school, I knew that I wanted to write. I just, I just wanted like to learn, you know, I, can't, I couldn't wait to go into college and say like, okay, I'm gonna learn some skills to actually start writing. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up writing for the magazines my dad used to read, you know. And I did, one of those magazines is Proceso Magazine, and I, and I had two um, covers, one of them actually talking about the CIA, a, a, a CIA operation in Mexico. Um, and, um, and the other one talking about um, how the DEA was uh, not really looking for narcos in Mexico, but looking for, you know, like gold medals to, to hang on their, their neck. And so when I, I went to college, I didn't study journalism, I studied like mass media, which was like a broader thing. I honestly thought like, I just need a paper, you know, because I was already working at a local newspaper. I went and knocked on the door trying to get a job as, um, to deliver the newspaper. I was like, that way I'm going to be the first one reading the news of yeah. my city. <laughs> and I can maybe find around how journalism works in a newsroom. So I went there, they told me like, all right, wait, wait on that chair. And then all of a sudden the editor of the, of the newspaper came down a stair. So I was like, you're here for the um, editor, right? Like, and I'm like, Yes, I'm exactly that guy. And <laughs> that was completely bullshit. Yeah. And um, he set me up on a computer, gave me a couple of articles, like a list of uh, news headlines, um, and a thing we call Domi, which was like the like 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 a like a like a small version of a newspaper page. Mm -hmm. um, and told me that's that's you today. And I'm like, all right, what the fuck am I gonna do with all of this? You know, I, I had no clue, but I started asking. And the friends around started helping me out, like on how to decide on which um, article was gonna be on, on on the front, which picture. I was super. I was like 19 years old by, back then, and and I was like, fuck it. I learned quick. I stayed there. Then they noticed that. Okay, so you weren't here for that job, right? I'm like, no, but I I have uh, six months now working here and delivering. So. What the, what the hell, you know? And he was like, all right, um, do you have a permit to work in the US? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a US citizen also. Was like, That's perfect, let's move you to the US newsroom. So they brought me into a Paso newsroom and it was like a small newsroom. So 
every time a, a journal, a reporter didn't show up, I was covering for that. I was like, me, I'll write it. Even if it's you know, like a crash around the corner, whatever, wow. I'll write it. Um, so I started like working my way up there, but always having an ear out and, a, and a, my eyes open to see what's going on in the cartel world and all that stuff. And I remember my first, if you could call it, investigation, which was kind of like shitty, you know, but uh, my first story about that was how some of the cartels in Ciudad Juarez were, were trying to recruit kids on a Metroflog social network, social media, mm. which Metroflog was huge back then in Mexico. It, uh, there was no Facebook or Twitter. It was just like Metroflog. What year was that? I think it was 2007. 2007? Something like that, 2007, 2006. How old are you? I'm 34, I'm about to turn 35. Okay. So I started, I started like somewhat young, you know, like writing about this stuff. My editor saw my pitch and he was like, this seems like, you know, like a conspiracy theory unless you bring me some proof. So I brought him a lot of proof, a lot of links between this Metroflog user, his this and that, and he killed this and that. And he's like, holy shit, you have a story there, man. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's run it. And it was on the front page of the, of, of the newspaper. So it was, it was like, I, I liked that feeling. But at the same time, it made me, because I was too young and too naive and too, you know, like too into it, I made some mistakes. I started writing about how corrupt the Mexican police were um, and how were they dealing information between the military, federals, local police, narcos. Even the DA was involved in that shit. Um, so I started writing about this woman who was a police officer and she was like trafficking information because she was like um, good looking. So mm -hmm. she was like literally fucking everybody <laughs> and, and trafficking information around. Um, and that was, uh, my editor said like, okay, we're gonna run, run that on the front page, but we're not gonna put your name into it. And I'm like, why not, man? It's my story. I mean, you sure? And it's like, Are you sure? I obviously didn't understand what that meant. You know? Yeah, so for your we own did. protection. Exactly, and so we did, and I got kidnapped by the local police in Ciudad Juarez. You got kidnapped. I got kidnapped by a local, yeah, by local officers, and, uh, and it was like, it was when I knew that I was into deep shit, and and it was not a game, you know. I was, I left my girlfriend at her house, was driving back to, I still live with my parents, driving back to my parents' house, in the middle of the night, and I got stopped by uh, first like a traffic police. And I'm like, wow, I'm not even, you know, doing anything, but I, I guess he's mistaken. So he told me like, hey, you just run that red light on a huge street. And I'm like, I, I did not, man. I mean, I'm, I'm watching the red light. And he's like, no, you did. Can I see your, your license? And I'm like, yeah. Grab my license, kind of laughed, um, said something on the radio, like codes, and then gave me back my license. He's like, ah, you're good to go. And I'm like, all right, that was weird kept driving and right in front of that, like two police tr pickup trucks just like crossed my, my, my way. Um, they started knocking with their guns on my window. It's like, get the fuck down, get the fuck down. And I'm like, all right. And I thought again, I think they're mistaking. Everybody's nervous because it's like the war, the war in Ciudad Juarez between cartels was just starting. And I'm like, I think they're mistaking, they're nervous because of everything that's going on in the city. So I grabbed my badge like from the news uh, paper and put it like behind my shirt. Um, and it's like, uh, we got, this is like, we got the journalist, yeah, it's him, all right, bye. And then it like started like sending quotes. And I'm like, oh shit. And I'm like, dude, you can take everything, like take my car, if you want money, I have some money, I can go to the ATM, get some money and just leave me alone. And they're like, no, 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 you just fucked up. You, you, you know what you did, and, and you fucked up real good this time. And I'm like, I, I have no clue, man, I'm, I'm cool. And, and so they tie my hands and feet, put me in the back of a truck, of the pickup truck. They put their feet like on top of me, you know, on my chest, and they started driving off, and someone else took my car. Um, and it was like 11 p.m., like in the middle mm -hmm. of the night. We went to a deserted parking lot, and then they stopped there. And then they asked me to run. And I'm like, I'm not gonna run because I know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna run, you're gonna shoot me and then you're gonna say it was a confusion or I had a gun or you thought I was this and that or some shit like that. So I was like, I'm not running, man. And I knew for that source 
that the local police and the federal police were fighting between each other because one was supporting one cartel and the other one was ha had a deal with another one. So I saw a convoy of federales driving by and I started jumping to see. I, ju I told him like I was cold because it was in the middle of the winter. So I started jumping and saying like, um, and they're like, hey, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to get some heat, man, because I'm, I'm, I'm freezing. And they're like, they just like kick me and they're like, hey, get on the fucking floor, I know what you're doing. And then the other guy was like, watch out the fox. They, that was the code for the federales, like fox. Watch it with the fox. And then the federales convoy just left, just passed by. And I was like, fuck. Um, and I remember they, I got on my knees and said like, if, you, if you're gonna do this, then just fucking do it. And I was thinking like, if my colleagues at the newspaper investigate this, they're gonna find out I was executed and I wasn't, you know, doing something else because I was on my knees. And I was like, that's how am I going to get on my knees? Um, at the end, I, I don't remember, like, being screaming or yelling, but they say that I was. I was like, stop fucking yelling, stop. And I'm like, I'm not yelling, man. I'm just asking you for a favor. And I was like, you, you're in no position to ask for anything. And, and I'm like, I can bring you money. I can bring you some money um, and just give me two hours and then we'll play, um, you know, um, cat and mouse again. She so said, no, but one of them was like, what if we, and then it started like talking codes, but I could understand that, what if we actually get some money from out of him, and then we end up catching him again and just killing him. And, uh, and I said, yes, 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 do that, let's do that, let's do that. And then the other, like, they started fighting each other, and then the, the commanders are like, all right, get up go to an ATM, and I'm like, no, there's your wallet. And I'm like, all right. And I'm like, just give me your word that you aren't gonna shoot me in the back while I'm walking. And he's like, you don't, you're in no position to ask me for any. So if you wanna go, go. If you're not, don't go. And I'm like, okay, I'll go. And I started walking and I felt like, shit, this is it, that they're gonna fucking shoot me off the back. Um, I hit a main street. Went to an ATM. I had two cards on me because um, there's following no, you. No, no one was following me. I could just run or and leave, but they had my address, my car plates, all of my documentation, and so I was like, of course they're gonna try and look for me at my house, you know, or my family or something like that. Yeah. So I went, tried to play it cool, um, got twelve thousand pesos, which is nothing, 600 bucks. That's, that was the limit of both my cards that, that I could withdraw. Um, got back and said so like, count it is 12,000 pesos. And it's like, I'm gonna trust you. Um, get in your car, make sure you're not missing anything. And I'm like, I don't even care. He's like, no, please make sure you're not missing anything because this is not a robbery. This is not what we want to you know, say that we're robbing you. Please look into your car, look into your wallet. You have everything. Yes, all right. You have two hours. We're gonna be looking for you again. So that same night, I crossed the border, stayed in El Paso for a good while, for like nine, nine months, I think, without being able to actually get back into Juarez. That was like traumatic, you know? It was yeah. like, oh, shit, I, I, can't, I can see my city from here, but I can't cross, I can't get back. And I have a source, and I had a source back then, a guy who was with me in um, secondary school, and we were like super good friends, and then he went off to the other side of the coin, you know, he went like, on the bad side, and he would like tell me how the whole cartel works and uh, like a lot of stuff, we will talk about a lot of stuff. And uh, he called me on my, we used to have like these Nextel radios, I don't know if you remember those, like mm -hmm. they were like very popular in Mexico back then. So he rang my radio and I was like, hey, what's up, man? He's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing working. And he's like, where are you? And I'm in El Paso. And he's like, I learned that you can't get back to Juarez. What happened? And I'm like, I, I didn't tell anyone, anyone. I, I, I talked to the owner of the newsroom, of the, of the paper, and I told him, like, I don't want anything. Like, Please and he was like, no, I need to call the mayor of Ciudad Juarez to give you protection and this and that. And I'm like, please don't, just don't tell anyone, anyone, please. And then he's like, all right, I won't, I won't do anything. I won't say anything. What you're gonna do is you're gonna 
file a complaint with human rights just so you have a preceding, you know, like a background in a case record. Of, a record, yeah, in, in case something happens. And I'm like, all right, I'll do that. And I did that, uh, but didn't tell anyone, just my family. And, um, and so I was like, hmm, how did the guy, this, this guy found out? And he was like, anyways, I don't know why you don't want to tell me we're friends and everything, but um, be, uh, be looking out in the news, like I, you're going to be surprised. And I'm like, all right. So I kept watching the news for the next days. And one of those days, in the same spot, they closed my road. Uh, the, those police officers were shot killed right there. Really? And uh, so I stopped communication with that guy. I was like, dude, that's not, I mean, we're not friends because of that, you know, like uh, that I'm completely different than that. I'm, I'm older than that. I'm not in the business of having people killed. Yeah. Um, actually, in the other side of, of the coin, you know, trying to make people um, skip their lives. And um, so, yeah, it was pretty damn hardcore. And uh, so I had a chance there to get out, we keep writing. And I was like, okay, I need to step up. I need to be more careful. That's why you study some of this shit. You know? That's why you go to college. Um, and that's why you learn. Uh, but, but right there was just starting the ugliest um, part of the history of Ciudad Juarez, where the killings were. It was the most violent city in the world. You know? like, yeah. They killed five friends of mine. Like, it was like hell. And I was just in the bridge of that. So, so I had to cover all that war writing for most uh, international organizations about what was going on in Ciudad Juarez. At the same time, figuring out how to protect myself, like how to have a protocol, uh, security protocols, and other stuff. Other stuff we know now in Mexico, it's just like basic stuff in journalism, you know, like safety protocols and other stuff. But back then, it, we weren't used to that. So I learned how to work in that, in that, you know, yeah. in that time. So. Where was your family at? Uh, at the time you were kidnapped, were they in, in Mexico or were they in Mexico? In? Yeah, my family was in Mexico, but they live in a in a gated community with uh, security guards, and you know, like it's like it's like a it's like a bubble in in Ciudad Juarez, where yeah. most of the uh, the business owners, like the biggest business owners in the city or in the state, they leave their politicians, all, all kind of people. Yeah, so they're very well protected. So. They still have to leave though, right? They have to leave their, their bubble. Yeah, they to go to work. They, exactly, to, to go to work, exactly. Food, uh, I, to, I told them, I told them like, um, this might be dangerous to you, you might be in danger too, because on my ID is that address, you know. They were like, you be safe, we'll be good. And I'm like, all right, that's, I mean, they're like that, <laughs> they're just weird. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so yeah, I left to El Paso. My sister left to El Paso too, and but my, both my parents uh, stayed in Juarez. They did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, wasn't expecting that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was, was not expecting that. Yeah, man. That so they, basically that's how I started. I mean, I started learning the the bad way, you know. And um, but uh, it helped a lot. Um, I've been doing this for twelve years now, and yeah. Um, so so yeah, I learned a lot. Well, how long was it bef uh, after you got kidnapped before you started going back? Like nine months. That's it? Just yeah. nine months? And yeah, because when, when that guy asked me to watch the news and I saw those guys were dead, yeah. it was like a mixed feeling, you know, because it was like, I, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to feel the responsibility for those lives. But, but at the same time, it's like, I, I feel like I can't go back now. You know, like I... They got rid of those guys, so I yeah. can I can actually go back to my city. And I started like I didn't like went all the way back. I started like going for a couple of hours, getting back, and then going a couple of more hours, then getting back. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, I'm, I feel good to get back to leave in Ciudad Juarez. You didn't uh, you didn't feel like that was coming from higher to kidnap you and and eventually kill you. You didn't think that was coming from higher? You think that may have been just those two cops? or you No, it definitely, def I definitely could tell that it was coming from higher, um, but, uh, but not that high. I think it was coming from specifically that girl. So she was like a commander. Okay. Uh, and because I, I had her phone number, so and I had access to some of her um, text messages. So I, um, 
I think I I stepped up too deep, you know. I I I think that's not what investigative journalism is. I just went to deep because I thought that was journalism, yeah. but it wasn't. But that didn't stop you because now you're yeah exactly doing all kinds of stuff. But so how long was it after you got kidnapped before you started kind of doing these stories again, where you were embedded and and things started getting a little dicey? So the whole hell broke loose in Ciudad Juarez. We had like 13 murders a day reported, plus those unreported. Um, and I started working for like two jobs and college. So I was, I bought a motorcycle so I can actually made it on time to college and then to the newsroom in El Paso. And at the same time, I had to cover for um, EFE, which has, it's like an international news based out of Spain. Um, and they will ask me to go to every single murder scene to report on that. So I will be driving all over town, you know, like um, sometimes I will report for El Diario in El Paso remotely. I will like write a big, like like a feature story, mm-hmm. but be reporting like certain damn murders a day in Ciudad Juarez. And that was very basic, but I learned a lot because I wasn't really investigating. I was just like covering like a... Uh, Red, what we call the red note, la nota roja. Um, they kill five cops here. They kill fifteen kids here. They kill, and it was like that. But you get your brain thinking and connecting the dots, and it's like, oh shit, this murder might be connected to that stuff, and to this, and to that investigation, and you start thinking. And I started like coming out with some proper features, you know, on investigation. And um, and again, I think it, it, that, that was like too raw of uh, journalism. It wasn't like proper th- stuff, mm-hmm. but it was like the beginning of trying to put together stuff and trying to explain what's going on. But it was hard for me to, at the time, because I was into the living that city, to see the bigger picture. Like yeah. this is something else than cartels killing each other, you know? Um, but that was my main question all through, that's been my main question all through these years, man. Like, like still to today, what the hell is going on in Mexico? What is really happening? Yeah. How does this world really work? Because I don't believe in the thing that it's a turf war between cartels, you know? So they were asking you to go and basically cover every single murder that happened in Juarez. And mm-hmm. they were doing, did you just say they were doing 13? 13 to 14, yeah. murders a day. Mm-hmm. How long were you doing that for? Uh, three years. Three years? Three years, yeah. So you've seen thousands, thousands. of yeah. dead bodies that have been murdered. Yeah. <clears throat> so my question is, what <clears throat> is it all cartel or cartel crime? Or what is what is the motive uh, to kill somebody down there when it's, if, if it's just a, a regular person who's not involved in the cartel, why are they getting murdered by the cartel? There's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, like the drug uh, business involves a lot of people, not only, you know, dealers or cartel members. It involves lawyers, mm-hmm. it involves business owners, it involves journalists, it involves a set of people. So sometimes when you see like, oh shit, they killed, they killed this woman and she used to be a teacher I'm not saying she was into the business directly, but sometimes they will try to extort her because they needed more money to get more weapons. So it was like, okay, she's driving a nice car. Let's try to extort her. And they, they, they will show up, ask for money. She will call the police. She will get killed because of the police was working with the cartel. So sometimes it's like that. There's been confusions. Like, I don't know if you um, heard about the killing of two employees of the U.S. consulate in Ciudad Juarez. Um, a man and his wife with a young girl in the back. Uh, and I, I had access to recording that the DA was doing on, on those guys. The, the DA was doing surveillance on that group of the cartel, the Juarez cartel. They were listening to recordings. They were like taping the phones and radios. Uh, and I got access to that and I, and I learned how they work. And it's shitty, you know, they don't have a system. They'll just say like, okay, so um, the hit is 
dark haired male in white SUV. That's it. And they have people all over the city. So that guy started receiving a bunch of rings from his people. It's like, okay, so I got black haired male with woman, white SUV right here. It's like, all right, um, okay, go for it. Five minutes later, it's like, hey, I have white SUV, dark haired man with a child. Uh, oh shit, we have another one. Uh, just go for the two of them. So they just kill anybody that fits the description. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're not, you know, they're just, yeah. just a blanket. Yeah. After like everybody four or five them. rings on different people, so it's like, okay, I have some other info. He has, it's called um, the, El Paso. They called it in, in code work Parque. So they don't say El Paso. So he has plates from El Parque. So it's like, oh, okay. So it's not my target. This has like Mexican plates. All right, bye. And so they narrow it down to El Paso plates, which is half of the city of Ciudad Juarez, you know. And um, so, well, Texas plates. And um, so, yeah, I, I learned that they don't, there's a lot of people innocent that are just killed just to because yeah. they fit a description. Exactly. What about uh, what about just regular crime? You know, that's non cartel related. How, how how much of that is just regular you know, crime? It's yeah. um, usually regular crime is not using firearms. Like they're not using they're using like if they use a firearm, it will be like a small firearm. You know, like it's not even going to be like a nine millimeter. Um, okay. Nine is definitely cartel related. Um, 223 cartel related all that stuff it's cartel related um, okay um, the other guys they sometimes they don't even they don't even kill you because they want to mug you you know because they know they're going to get some hit and they know that if they got arrested they're going to put some other charges on them like a lot you know they're going to be like organized crime and this guy had like two kilos of heroin and this and that and that and he was just like a regular fucking mugger that was trying to get your phone. You know, so, okay. so yeah, that's um, now the the local um, drug business, like the street selling. That's that's huge. That's a huge business in Juarez since the nineties, um, and and that's why you have a bunch of sellers getting killed, getting murdered, getting threats, you know, getting getting crazy. Just last night, I saw a video of two women uh, being tortured and and killed in, in a place called Cuauhtem- Cuauhtemoc, a few hours from Juarez. And everybody's like, they're teachers. Why were they murdered? But in, in the video I saw, they were interrogating them. I was like, who do you work for? And they're like, this guy. And what are you doing? We're selling. And who are you selling to? Well, I was selling in this spot. So it's like, damn, man. Sometimes like people you don't even think about are into some shit, you know, yeah. somehow. <clears throat> well, then you started getting, so you started reporting all these murders and then and then it sounds like that wasn't really enough for you, so you wanted to get yeah. more into the investigation, investigative mm-hmm. uh, type stories. And that can be hard to bust into. So yeah. I'm kind of curious, you know, how it is that you started developing sources and assets and informants or whatever you call them in the journalism world you know and uh, from what I found is once it can be real hard to get in Mm -hmm. but once you find one that opens the door for everybody yeah and so I'm just curious to see you know how you kind of developed your first asset Mm -hmm. or what do you call them do you call them assets? sources 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 how did you develop your first source well, my first source was actually this friend I was just telling you about. He was, uh, we were in secondary school and we grew up together. We lived nearby. We just to hang out together. And then he started going into, into that world and started writing. I remember one time we were drinking at my place and we were like super smashed. And I told him like, you know that there's gonna be a time where our worlds are gonna meet not in the best way, right? <laughs> And he's like, yeah, and he, I remember he gave, me, gave me a hug and he's like, you're still gonna be my friend, no matter what, man, like, you're gonna be my friend. Sometimes I guess I'm gonna have to stop talking to you. And sometimes I guess you're gonna step on my toes, but um, I'll keep doing my job and you keep doing yours. So we started like splitting, but, see, but even then, um, he will introduce me to other guy, you know, like, he will like, hey man, 
come over. And I'm like, all right. And I would show up in a house with armed people and you know, I was like, oh, okay, so this is this is a place he wants to show me. Um, and then he introduced me to one of the bosses, you know, like, hey, this is that, and this is my cousin, um, he's a journalist, and he's like, hey, then making like, um, making like jokes about me reporting is like, just don't report this shit, okay? And I'm like, no, man, like honestly, I'm here just like a, you know, <laughs> like a regular person. Um, most of those guys, you get them either by Drinking, doing drugs, or partying. The party is where you make bonds in that world. If you don't party, you're never gonna get access to any of that shit. You, um, and you're gonna look like something else, you know? Mm-hmm. You're gonna look like, so why is he doing, what is he doing here? What does he want? Is he a DA? Because everybody in Mexico thinks like everybody's fucking DA. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's how you do it. So yeah, the party it was what made the bonds, so I have my toll, you know, <laughs> party. Yeah. Sometimes um, my wife, uh, she knows what I do. Um, she doesn't really know any details of what I'm doing until my story is published. And even then, she doesn't really know the details or the yeah. backstories. Um, but at the beginning, she was like, it's fucking 3 a.m., man, and you're not answering. Yeah. But I'm like, you're gonna have to trust me in this one because I'm not, you know, doing something else than working and having a blast with these guys. Yeah. And sometimes I will get home like super wasted, high on coke, you know, like stuff like that. And, and but that's what will open doors, you know, that's yeah. that what will open me doors. Do you enjoy it? I mean, it's a good time. No, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like party is party, you know, sometimes it's just too much. Sometimes it's, it becomes a place where you start having like a bad trip sort of, you know, like when you are drunk and all fussy and confused and and you're like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like these people, uh, they I don't relate to these people at all. Yeah. Uh, what they're talking, what they're saying. Um, I don't know, I just can't find a common place between us. Where are you guys partying? Are you part, what do you have? Bars, most 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 of, most of the time is houses. yeah most of the time is particular houses like houses they have um, sometimes bars but not really because very private yeah very private Invite stuff only. Mm-hmm. yeah sometimes it's just like a small party sometimes it's just like a you know like not even like a, an overnight or whatever a couple of beers um, having fun uh, shots or whatever and then they'll be like okay that's it I'm good and mm-hmm. because they see that you are um, into that. Uh, they feel comfortable with you, and it's it's harder for a Mexican journalist to get access into a Mexican, you know, like criminal organization, because when they see if you are from somewhere else, they will say like, okay, I like this guy because if I can confirm it's not DA or whatever, um, it's cool that he's here, that he's interesting in interested in this, and he's gonna go report whatever. Um, but but um, they feel they can trust it him more because he's not we're going to be working with a local police or with another cartel or that, that kind of shit well, I don't, what is the what is the uh what's the motivation to have an investigative journalist at the party with the cartels that you're saying that you know they trust you i mean why the fuck would a cartel trust an investigative journalist <laughs> i guess i guess because it's not I have never done something or written about something they don't know I'm gonna write. You know, I'm I'm full disclaimer. If I'm there partying with them, I'm there, there partying with them. Um, learning, I'm I'm finding my way through to get access and trust of them. Mm-hmm. But um, but I'm not gonna report on that. I'm not gonna say anything I hear in that party. I'm not gonna report on that. I'm not gonna write on that. I'm not gonna say any anything because I know that's gonna cost me, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and they know that. I think they can feel that I'm transparent and that I'm like, I'm not here to snitch on you, man. I'm, I'm here to actually party with you, to get to know you, to ask some questions for me, for myself, mm-hmm. to, to know what's gonna be my next steps. And then when I want to write a story, when I need something, then I will reach out full transparency. I will be like, I'm writing a story about this. Do you feel comfortable sharing something with me? And they will say like, no, not at all, man. I cannot give you an interview. And I'm like, I mean, under what circumstances will you feel comfortable giving me an interview? 
and it's like no face, no name, no this, no that, and then I'll I'll work that. You know, it's a negotiation. It's yeah. like, hey man, um, okay, I'm not gonna put your name, your face. I really need to write that you are part of that organization in this place. Is that doable? And it's like, ah, I don't know, man. So we start like talking about that, and then sometimes I, they say yes, sometimes they say no, not at all. And when they say no, it's a no, and yeah. rather lose a story. You know? I guess my question is, what is the motivation for them? Of what do they get out of it? Why would they even want anything in the news at all? Uh, it's any di- information to you at all? It's different between organizations, and that's that's an interesting side of it. Um, the Juarez Cartel, super s- hermetic, like they they don't share anything. It's super hard to break inside the Juarez Cartel because they don't feel motivated at all to talk to say anything. They just don't give a fuck. They, mm-hmm. they actually go the other way. They're like, no, man. Um, you have to have solid sources inside. They have to trust you a lot. And even then, I found that most of them will just like talk broadly on stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Sinaloa Cartel, they almost have like this PR office. <laughs> they really want to be out there. They want to be out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they, is it, for recruiting or? I think it's just to... To make a point, to make a point where like we're still on top, we're still on top of the game. So it's it's to to flex, to spread fear, exactly to the other cartels and Mm -hmm. to the to the public in general, general Mexican population. Yeah, it's just like a flexing move, you know. Like we're still we're still the the bad guys here, Um, and whenever I ask uh, for access there, um, I have a great source in Sinaloa that I really trust, and he really trusts me, and we're friends and. And um, he helps me a lot, like a lot. Every time I ask him for crazy shit, man, like I've asked him for crazy stuff. And it's like, hey man, can you help me out with this? He knows that when his phone rings, it, I, I think it rolls his eyes like, oh my God, here he comes again. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> cause I push and I push hard, cause that's my job, you know? I'm not gonna take just like, no, we can do that. All right, bye man, sorry. It's like, how can we do this? How can I tell this story, man? How can you help me out? I need this profile specifically. I need to find a person that talks to me and that knows about this. Why, how can we do that? And when it's like, no, 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 no. I was like, okay, what if I show up there? We just have a drink and talk, talk it over, but in person, not over the phone, not over signal or telegram or whatever. Just right there. And then we go from there. And 90% of the time it works. 90% of the time is like, all right, let's go. Let's talk to him. Say what he says. Um, to be honest, like also some, some of them ask for money. Some, some of them, uh, they try to get some money out of that. Out of that. How much money? Uh, not that much, but it depends. It depends on the access. It depends on the days. It depends on the person. Hundreds, thousands, tens thousands. of thousands. Yeah, no, hundred now. Thousands of dollars. Thousands okay. of dollars. They, they would ask for, for money. Sometimes it's not even for them, but it's like to pay the employees, you know? Okay. Um, of course, this is like, as I'm telling you, this is full disclaimer. I'm, I'm very transparent in what I do. Most of the times I try not to. I try not to, because it's not ethical and it can not be real what they're telling you if their motivation is money. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes I've, I've worked like that. I've, I've, I've worked like that. When I, see, when I see that what I need basically is B-roll, you know? Yeah. I don't need info. I need B-roll. I need a bunch of imagery of guns or training of this and that. And you want video assets for your stories mm-hmm. or and photos. It's, uh, yeah. And I need like to be real, you know? Yeah. Um, not, not like fake guns or whatever, like to be real. So you, you just totally immerse yourself into the <laughs> narco culture to gain their trust, to experience it so you understand it better. How long are you, when you do immerse yourself, what's, what would you say What's the longest you've immersed yourself down there within uh, some of these cartels before coming up and going back home and checking in with the wife and kid? And, you mm, know? Not too long. I try to I try to have like a tight a safety protocol, you mm-hmm. know. So I don't tell my wife what I'm going or what I'm doing, like specifics, but she knows that I constantly ring, and she's my like. It's crazy because I do that protocol with some friends, with some journalists, 
and with associations of journalists to protect journalists in Mexico. You know, when, I'm, when I know I'm gonna be in too deep, I bring on them and say like, hey man, can we start like a protocol? Uh, they're like, yeah. So the protocol is like, ring me every two hours or half an hour. Um, or if you're gonna be out all day, just in one part of the day before uh, midnight, you're gonna have to bring me back and say like, okay, I'm back at the hotel, I'm safe. And I'm like, okay. But my safety net is my wife because she can feel the threat or the danger beforehand. You know, yeah. she, um, she knows that when I'm not feeling comfortable, I tend to call her a lot, not, not text her, not WhatsApp. I t- tend to call her a lot, like a yeah. lot. Call her in the night, in the morning, when I have breakfast. And she feels that. She feels like, okay, this guy is not feeling good about what he's doing right now. He might be in danger. Yeah. Um, so she knows that I could be in danger. So she tries to ring more often. So you're checking in at least at least once a day. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I've never I've never been more than more than one day. Like I've had uh, I have the case like the scenario where it's like okay we're gonna go into that place no cell phones this and that but I try also to negotiate my side you know like not to go full on it's like yeah whatever you say it's like no man no no phones it's a no go for me are they are they frisking you are they searching you before I just had one time just had one time they trust you that much yeah I just had one time with a guy in Sonora that um that he uh, searched me uh he grabbed my phone he applied phone to me well the beginning his his employee uh put like a thing on my eyes but he thought it was too disrespectful. He was like, no, 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 dude, that's disrespectful for the journalists here. Just, let's do this. Um, grab your hands, put your, ha- your head down all the, all the road, just look down, that's it. Um, even then I could know where, <laughs> where I was because I sort of like, you know, I knew that we crossed like a train uh, track. Uh, I've heard um, 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 a, a checkpoint, a police checkpoint. Uh, I could count the street lights sh- sh- passing. Sh- sh- sh. Then I read dirt road, so I sort of know where I was at the yeah. time. Um, I didn't like that. Uh, I didn't really like that at all. Like I was like, no man, I'm not gonna do this shit again. Because we were there, and then he had it was incredible, man. It was, and the the story is in uh, Netflix. It's a show called Dope. And if you see the Mexico side of that series, I, I didn't do any of the U.S. side, I did all the Mexican side. You will see a scene where we arrive at a house and uh, there's this narco and it says like, so this is my stash house. And I was like, all right, um, that small house right there? And it was just like an old man with a tecate, you know, like drinking. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, but there's nothing, man. <laughs> what the fuck is this? And he's like, nah, I'm not that stupid, man. Hey guys, can you open up the stash so it was like they started like putting dirt out with a shovel and then we'll have a, a, a carpet and then behind a carpet you will have a door like a like a um iron door they will open that and there was like a stairs and it was like an underground stash house packed with it was weed and poppy in that in that in the stash house but it was like floor to roof you know like full of that stuff and they had their all of their accounting and inventory everything everything like and yeah so, so it was under the house under the house but you couldn't you couldn't tell because it was like a small house in the middle of nowhere and it was like dirt just like that we were like actually stepping into like a, on top of that so we went out we went down there we filmed everything we filmed an interview and all that stuff um and then we went up again and then he received a call on his, on his radio um, someone telling him that one of the security rings was breached by a um, convoy of uh, Federales. And he's like, okay, so my fifth ring got compromised. Let's wait here. Give me your ID. I'll keep all of your IDs. If something happens, if they break into the second ring, it's on you guys. And I'm like, Okay, I mean, it's not gonna be on us, man. We're not even, we don't have cell phones. Um, it's, I mean, no, there's no way. And he's like, I don't care what you say, man. If they breach second rank, it's gonna be on you. 
And I'm like, all right. So it was like a tense because it's like, okay, they breached into the fourth ring. And then they reached the third ring. And I was like, fuck, 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 fuck. And they, um, they stopped at a burritos place to eat burritos. You know? <laughs> and they're like, no, están comiendo burritos ahí en la esquina. <laughs> And he's like, all right, that's good for you. All right, yeah. there you go, man. Let's go. <laughs> Give these guys an extra burrito. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Yes, man. It was, it was, it was intense that so time. So you're really embedded with these guys. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick break. And sure. uh, when we come back, I want to get into some of these uh, arms trafficking deals that uh, you were a part of and, and were able to report on. Yeah, sure. Cool. For sure, man. All right, so we're going to get into some arms trafficking stuff. And um, before I do, we had a good conversation at breakfast today about, you know, I cannot believe that you don't carry a gun. And I couldn't believe it when you told me um, when we were talking earlier today about some of the stuff that you've been doing and that you've been involved with and who you're embedding with. Then we get in the studio here and we start recording and tell me you've been kidnapped. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So that <laughs> blows my mind that, that you're not carrying um, into each zone. But before we kind of get into the arms trafficking stuff, I'm really curious <clears throat> without the, if I wanted to go down to Mexico, how hard would it be for me to illegally acquire some type of a firearm? It will definitely be easier than to acquire like a legal arm you know? yeah. it's, uh, it's not that hard man like um, Mexico is flooded with with guns like it, they're all over um, it's very easy it's just you need like to know someone mm -hmm. uh, and you can get one many of the cartels now what they're doing is they are uh, renting like, you know like uh, firearms you don't even have to buy it they will take you into a warehouse and you're a hitman and but you don't own a gun um, so you go to that warehouse and say like, hey, how much for this gun? Two hours or two days. And it's like, it's going to be, I don't know, 2,000 pesos, 4,000 pesos, 12,000 pesos. You rent it? You rent it. You rent the weapon. Yes. And then you to go, go do the job. take a hit, get back and deliver back the gun to that same warehouse. Have you seen these warehouses? Yes, I've seen those warehouses. Uh, they What's look the like, selection like? Well, like, what do they have? Yeah. Um, all kinds of shit. They have a bunch of nine millimeters, a bunch of shitty revolvers, you know, like these old revolvers. Mm -hmm. They have AKs. Uh, they have uh, what the Mexican uh, military uses, which is the 223. I don't know what kind of rifle it is, but the, the bullet is a 223. It's, okay. it's not. So probably some type of an M4 or AR-15. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. It's like something long. Mm -hmm. um, they have like that kind of stuff. Those guys who rent those kind of guns, the, it's like all guns, you know, like they're like sort of, uh, sort of like manipulated in, in some way. They're not like new pristine state guns. Yeah. It's like ugly, ugly weaponry. Uh, and that, that, yeah, I guess it's like the second life they give to guns they used uh, in like bigger uh, scales of the cartel, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when you go in these warehouses, is it all organized? Is everything on the wall? No, no, or is it, hey, no. live, look at the trunk of my car and uh, there's just a whole bunch of... <clears throat> no, I mean, um, the warehouse I've, um, I've been into, there are in Juarez, downtown Juarez. Imagine downtown Juarez. Imagine the city, border city, of 1.4 million uh, people living there. Not the beautiful, not a beautiful city, kind of a shitty one. Imagine a market in downtown, crowded, a lot of people, um, you know, like a regular market selling fruits, selling a lot of shit, medicine and a lot of stuff. People screaming, people yelling, cars going into, you know, like small, uh, small alleys. And in between all that, it's a store, a regular store selling sneakers, uh, counterfeit, you know, like fake Nike sneakers, fake whatever. 
with a man outside saying like, hey, come get some sneakers, 20 bucks for the pair, whatever. But if you arrive there with the right guy, he'll be like, hey man, he's with me, all right. And then you just go to the back of that um, store. Uh, and there's a warehouse, which is around like about this big. It's not like a huge warehouse, not small. And you have guns all over. The guns okay. like laying there, um, you know, like just in the wall, like right there, uh, on the floor, and an ugly table. Uh, he can't find sometimes the, you know, like the gun he's looking for. He's like, I know I have an AK, like a new AK around here. So he's like rummaging around. Mm -hmm. And then he finds like the AK. He's like, oh yeah, here it is. Can't find the charger though. And he's looking for the charger. Um, all duct taped, you know, because yeah. it's not properly working or fitting. Uh, yeah, it's one of those places. And I'm like, wow. And uh, you're like, so you sell these guns? And it's like, nah, we actually rent them. And while I was there in the middle of the day, like 2 p.m., uh, a guy showed in and he's like, hey man, hey, hey, you just need two guns, like handguns, whatever you have, but for now, no, no, I need it now. And it's like, did you talk to whatever? Yeah, 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 I talked to him and yeah. All right, it's gonna be this and that. I already paid that guy. Let me yeah. give him a call. Hey man, the, the guy, this guy here, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's a good, he paid. All right, see you, there you go. So these are all hitmen coming in and all out hitmen, of there. Yeah, yeah. Low level hitmen, they're not like, you know, there's like, also some hitmen that are like very well prepared. Yeah. Most of them working for um, um, law enforcement in Mexico. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do these guys, um, do they have any rituals or traditions they do before they go on a hit? Like when I was, uh, I used to live in Colombia, I used to live in Medellin, and they have a church mm -hmm. that they would go and all the assassins would go pray at that specific church before mm -hmm. they would go on a hit. And uh, is it like that in Mexico too? Do they get you're talking the Virgen de los Sicarios, right? You're, yeah, you're talking about that one in Colombia. No, I mean in Mexico, it depends. Like Sinaloa, it's uh, Jesus Malverde is is huge. Um, he's the saint of um, drug traffickers. He's a legend, and um, and they go and sometimes they will have just like on their houses they will have like a small um, altar for Jesus Malverde, where they drop cigarettes, booze, um, drugs. Offerings. Um, uh -huh. um, there's, a, there's a huge Jesus Malverde um, altar in the middle of, of, the, of a road where they go also and offer stuff for him. Uh, many of them, and it, that was kind of new in 2010, we started watching new uh, Santa Muerte churches in Juarez. And I went to all of them, you know. Um, curious like that so i was like what the hell this is a fucking santa muerte full-on church um so i was interested into to what was going on in there um and it's crazy man it's uh doesn't make sense it's i mean not disrespectful but uh but it's just like too mixed with catholicism they will pray some of the parts of the holy father padre nuestro blah 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 and in the middle of that, they will say something like, Santa, querida Santa Muerte, Niña Blanca, no sé qué, this and that. And I'm like, wow, that's, that seems like bullshit, you know? But, um, but many of them believe in the Santa Muerte. And it started developing in 2010 in Juarez because the, northern, the north of Mexico, that was not a tradition in the north of Mexico. That was a tradition in the center and south of Mexico for centuries. Uh, but when the militaries and the federales started arriving in the city, they brought with them some of their culture. So they started like setting up, you know, churches and all that stuff. Does that translate to saint of the dead? Yes, the okay. Santa Muerte is the ho holy death. Okay. And it's this, um, it's this um, skeleton dressed as the Holy Mary, you know, like with a thing. Yeah. But it's a skeleton. And okay. It's, and, and it has the... the Host is called? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it's called. I know what you're saying. Though. Yeah. The, the, uh, the sickle. That's exactly. What they call it, yeah. The sickle. Yeah. Spanish is called uh, la guadaña, right? Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Like, so, so they, some of them have those rituals. Um, I can tell that most of them, when they pray or have a Santa Muerte, uh, they are related to law enforcement. Most of the time, not all of them, because I watched some stash houses 
where they are like not law enforcement related sicarios and they will have a small Santa Muerte on a corner. Um, so, so, and I know that Sinaloa is huge for Jesus Malverde, um, a U.S. artist. Uh, I, I took him to Sinaloa to take some pictures of, of the narco culture and all that stuff. And he um, is called Charles Kraft, and he makes um, ceramic art amazing. Mm. And he gave me a bust of Jesus Malverde on ceram and ceramic, like this big. And I have it in my in my living room, you know, <laughs> like right there. What is that? The, the, the what are you saying? It's like a it's like a figure of Jesus Malverde made okay. out of uh, ceramic. You know, it's a uh, painter like very beautifully. Um, he was uh, th that was like his thanks to me. You know, like he was like thank you for taking me to Sinaloa to make some crazy ass pictures on the narco culture, and I'm gonna give you this. So I have it in my, on my living room, on my TV room, you know, it's like right there on top of everything. And, um, and I love it, and, but sometimes where people shows up in my place and they're like, oh wow, why do you have a Jesus Malverde on your <laughs> living room, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, it's a, it's a work of art, it's just the first of 10, you know, there's only 10 in the world and it has a value, like it, um, it worth something, uh, but it has also like a value to me um, wow. in, inside that culture. That's mm -hmm. cool. It's interesting, yeah. Well, let's get into some of these arms deals. Yeah, so I was, um, by the time we, were, we talked about the, um, like a, a Zoom call, remember? Mm -hmm. Right after that, I traveled to Sinaloa to meet with some arms traffickers. Well, we, I traveled to Sinaloa and then to Mexicali because the route is the U.S. border towns like um, Calexico, El Paso, uh, Tijuana, well, San Diego and then south, either Tijuana, Mexicali, or Ciudad Juarez, and then down to Sinaloa, Durango, Sonora. Um, and so I met with these guys, I explained them that I wanted to understand um, how was the arms still flowing south, still after Fast and Furious, still after a tight gun control in Mexico, um, still after all of that, uh, the border closed, um, how how you manage to actually still bring up, bring in like huge guns? I showed you some pictures on what they look, and I was like, what what the hell is this one? <laughs> it's like yeah. that's a gren grenade launcher, right? That is a M203 grenade launcher that fires a 40 millimeter, basically explosive. It's like how does these guys get a hold of some shit like that? You know. Yeah. So it's like heavy weaponry they have, and they just show me the the basic, you know. So, so I went to Sinaloa. They took me to this place, a proper house, where they have some of um, you know like gold, um, nine millimeters gold AK-47. They used a lot these call uh, this stuff called Draco, which is like a short um, AK. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I don't know if you know. I don't know. If, I mean, they call it Draco down. Done in Mexico. Yeah, I mean, here they would just call it an AK. An AK, right? Yeah. It's like a short version of the yeah. of the big AK. They have a bunch of them. Some of them like um, all golden, you know, very flashy stuff. Uh, and I, I I follow the the road to the U.S. So in the U.S., in places like California or like Texas, they will just buy a gun with a permit. Someone like me or like you. And um, that guy is clean, he has his own guns, but he's selling um, all the guns to, to the cartel, to cartel members. What he needs is just like a report of the guns he sold so he can show ATF, like, sold these guns because I have a permit to sell guns uh, out of my own home, out of my own place. Um, what they do with that, I just don't give a fuck. So I don't know if the ATF actually tracks uh, those buyers or not. But these guys are like, and I know for a fact that many of those guns are ending up in Mexico. And also, really? So they, how they traffic stuff is they disassemble the guns and they put small parts inside like old refrigerators, a stove, you know, an old living room or whatever. And then they're like, oh, just moving back to Juarez from El Paso and I'm going to pay my, my taxes for the for my stuff mm -hmm. to get into Mexico. So they will pay that. 
go in and then they have like these workshops where they're putting everything together again. I went to one of those in Mexicali. I think one of the videos I shared is, is one of those places you will see like a table with a bunch of guns. Those are the guns that are ready to go. They are like a sample back again. Uh, and then from there, um, they go to Sinaloa, like by plane, by truck, um, sometimes even by sea when they are in, the, in Baja California, they travel through the Mar de Cortes all the way to the Sinaloa coast. And um, that's, that's where, they, where for, for they told me, that's where the heavy weaponry is going through. Like, Why does it go there? Because I think it's easier to navigate the sea than to actually, uh, you know, like, ride. Uh, okay, so they go there and then it's dispersed? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They go, they, uh, most of them go to Sinaloa, and then from there they, they end up even in, Latin, in Central America, places like Honduras, Guatemala. Um, they trade that for drugs or for, you know, like when, you, when they don't have a payment for a big load of coke, they will say like, okay, we'll give you guns, you give us the coke, and we'll take it north and, and sell it. So sometimes it's like a trade. Um, those guns are fucking everywhere, man. It's, uh, it's, really, it's really confusing to see that many guns and that easy access in Mexico, a place where it's impossible to get a proper a firearm like myself I um, I mean to me to get a hold of a firearm in Mexico it will be super hard I will have to be in a um, hunting club mm -hmm. or go through a lot of fucking bureaucracy to actually get approved for a permit to carry and I wouldn't be able to carry a nine millimeter or a rifle you know like it will be just like a shitty gun I guess yeah <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of weird. It's kind of, I mean, in the U.S., I could have a gun. But, yeah. Uh, I don't even know how to use one, so I need to learn. <laughs> <clears throat> how would people? I mean, do you think? Do you think Mexican citizens would want access to be able to protect themselves? It's been a debate, like um, recent debate, and it's always in, in in people's opinion. You know, like it's very divided, it's very split. Um, Half of the people say, like, we don't need guns. What we need is for corruption to end. Because mm -hmm. without corruption, you will have a state of law, and those people getting illegal weapons mm -hmm. will stop. Many of those guys believe that the responsibility is, in Mexico, half, in the U.S., the other half. It's like your, um, your freedom to get guns is hurting us, you know? Mm -hmm. Some of the other guys are like, we should be more like the U.S., where you can access guns, where you can actually fight back, you know, where, where I can protect my family yeah. with a gun of those guys. Because yeah. if they get to you, I'm still not sure where I stand, to be honest, on that, that matter, because I'm very, I'm, very, um, I'm very in the in both worlds, you know. Like, I, I can get one in, in El Paso, which is like Texas, is the, the, the gun culture is like very open. But at the same time, I know what they do, you know, I know what they mean for mm -hmm. Mexico. And I've seen my friends killed by those guns and all that stuff. So, so I'm still, I'm, I still don't know where I stand. You're on and the fence. So, exactly. Because um, on one side I said like, oh yeah, yes, I mean, of course, on what I'm doing, because of what I'm doing, especially, I should have one, you know, to protect my family. Because I never know when a motherfucker is going to come up. And when I'm going to have to fight back. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, do I want to engage in a sh shootout? Do I want to engage into that? Because I know if I kill that guy or that couple of guys that got into me, there's going to be more coming. You know, there's going to be more coming. Mm -hmm. They're going to get mad. They're going to get angrier. They're going to get like again. So, so I, I, I don't know. You know, when I think about my family, how to protect them, I feel that the best way to protect them is sometimes not talk a lot of what I do, a lot of details of what I see, of what I hear, of my cell phone. My wife, she, she gets uh, sketchy because I'm always like, you know, protecting my cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Of course she believes that it's, yeah. it's another, can, another girl. You know? I can see that where that could, uh, that could become an issue. Exactly. Especially when you're partying with the cartel. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And she, sometimes she believes like the worst for her. You yeah. Know? She believes like uh, this motherfucker is talking to another girl. Yeah. But most of the time, don't get me wrong, <laughs> most of the time, 
it's not like that. Most of the time is um, I don't want her to see some pictures. I don't want her to see some uh, messages. Um, I don't want her to see who is sending me messages because I don't feel comfortable f with her knowing who yeah. I'm talking with. When, you know, um, the other is living in El Paso. Um, the other is trying to get the heat out when I'm covering like a interesting story, like a hardcore story. Not going straight home and take my kid out in the same car and drive around, you know, like mm -hmm. it's just like I'm gonna be away for a couple of days until I feel the heat is out. I try to reach back to my sources after the story is out and say, so like, hey, we're good, are we cool? Is everything good? Do you feel something shady? There's been two times where things haven't been cool at all, where I reach back and the wife of my source will answer, it's like, they kill him. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And I yeah. feel like, you know, like shit. I feel like shit. I feel like it's my responsibility. I feel like his life is on my hands. And, and um, yeah, uh, those times are like, oh, my fucking God. Because at the same time, I'm, I'm feeling responsibility for that. And at the same time, I'm feeling fear for my own life. Like, if they got to him, are they mad at me, too? Yeah. Are they angry at me, too? So... Those kind of stuff are the ones that gets you up at night, you know, like that, like you stay all night thinking, like, should I be uh, doing something or would I be overreacting? You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to have my family all nervous all the time. Yeah. But at the same time, I need to protect them. So sometimes I fall. Yeah. How did these deals go down? These arms deals that you. What was your role there? They. Why did they let you witness? Because the whole deal go down. <laughs> because I, I wanted that. There is a lot of stuff in the news that just repeats, keeps repeating, you know, like talking points. And people keeps repeating the U.S., this is the U.S. fault. And the narcos are getting guns. And the narcos are getting just like big weapons. And it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, but what, what does that mean? Like, how do they get the guns and who and why? And are cartels inside the U.S.? Are cartels properly buying? guns in the US or is it just like a regular one trying to make some bugs and they don't see the harm in selling those guns to a cartel. I wanted to understand that. I wanted to really get close to that and to understand what's what was on. And what I found out is like in general cartels are not um, a structure like you know like a vertical structure. They're more like on a horizontal uh, structure now. You don't have a big bus and then uh, you know, like another sort of like chief and then like a bunch of sicarios and then like a bunch of whatever. It's all horizontal now, right now. That's why a lot of the law enforcement don't get, you know, that's why some of their operations don't get, don't get the, the results they are expecting. When you grab a kingpin, he was just part of that horizontal structure. It was not the boss. You didn't cut the head of the snake. You just cut a chunk. Yeah. You know? um, and the snake can grow a tail again. And so it works like that. And the, and the arms deals are exactly like that. There was once where the big boss will call his people in the US or whatever and say like, hey, I need guns. All right, let's buy guns. There you go, boss. Your guns. All right. You're still on a payroll. You're still getting the same money. But right now, it's like, I need guns. We're getting out of guns. What do we do? And it's like, okay, I have a plug in the US. I have a cousin that he's a US citizen. He can get a gun for us or several. All right, try it out. And he's like, yeah, but he wants to, he's gonna, he's gonna buy, I don't know, an AK for 500 bucks, but he's gonna sell it to us, um, triple the, the price mm -hmm. for 15K, 15,000, 100, sorry. And um, I need, Someone will say yes, all right, yeah, just give it that, just bring it back, and they will, you know, like one guy is like, okay, and what's my commission for crossing it over? Okay, you get three hundred bucks, and then the guy who takes us all the way to Sinaloa, like, how much for transporting this to Sinaloa? Three hundred bucks. All right, there you go, hmm. and then you know, so it's a, it's an horizontal chain. It's not a big structure, so everybody's making money out of that. Yeah. But he's making money uh, out of the, a, a gun deal, you know, and that's, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting because 
Because when you say something like the U.S. has responsibility, well, the U.S. just made 500 bucks on that. Someone else made another 500, and someone else made 300, and someone else made another 300 for that gun to reach the hand of the guy who's going to kill a bunch of people. Yeah. So most of that money is still staying in Mexico. You know? Yeah. And it's not entering like a legal uh, economy. Hmm. <clears throat> so I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're saying is it's not one major deal that's happening. It's onesies and twosies and just thousands and thousands of people that exactly. are making that are making 300, you know, 500, a one. small amount of a nominal amount of money, mm -hmm. you know, for one one weapon. Exactly. Yeah. I, um, I talked to a guy in Juarez also and he's like, I found that if I if I if I travel to the U.S. to like Dallas to a gun show, they will sell guns to me like that. And I will just take him back into Mexico before um, um, Fast and Furious and all that stuff. It was like more, you know, easy to travel back into Mexico yeah. without being searched. Uh, so it's like I found that I would just like travel back to Chihuahua. It's like nine hours from Juarez to Dallas, nine hours back, and then four hours to Chihuahua, and I will make a thousand bucks for one gun yeah. every weekend. So it's like, hmm, I might bring three, and it's three thousand bucks yeah. on one weekend, and the next weekend again, the next weekend again, the next weekend again, and he made a good living out of that, you know, like three thousand bucks in Mexico can be like every weekend, can be like something to to start something, you know? Yeah. I guess that's another reason why maybe, you know, securing the border a little bit more might be beneficial for both countries. Exactly. The thing is, uh, the thing is when you secure the border on the Mexican side, like right now, they're changing the Mexican IRS, which is called SAT. Those were the guys in charge of customs. They're so corrupted, man. Like they're, they're one of the most corrupted organizations, uh, government organizations in Mexico. So they were like, okay, we're gonna change that to the military. Mm -hmm. The military is not, is not that corrupt, but it's known for stepping on human rights. You know? yeah. So, so it's like, I don't know if that's gonna work. I don't know if that's gonna work actually. Um, I think corruption in general needs to change because corruption is what is killing us in Mexico. You know, it's not, it's not the U.S. It's not this and that. It's not open or closed borders. I think what's killing us is corruption. That's what is keeping us safe on this side of the border. Your corruption levels are, are there, but at higher levels, like higher officials, it's gonna be hard for you to get out of a ticket giving 20 bucks to a traffic police officer, you know? It's not, there's no way you can give them 20 bucks for yeah. that guy to leave you alone. Um, but in Mexico, you can, you can get away with that, you know? And that's, that's exactly what is killing us. Corruption is, is inside the whole system. It's a system. It's not corruption. It's not inside the system. Cor corruption is a system on itself, you know? So, and that's what is killing us. Like, you can put all of the military out in the streets, all of the DAs you want, close all the borders you want. But as long as the corruption is still a system operating in Mexico, there's going to be a way for people to benefit from legal or illegal activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move into the DEA deal. <laughs> of course, man. <laughs> I'm dying to hear about this. Well, you know, the Sinaloa cartel has been one of the biggest cartels in Mexico for a good while. You know, it started with the Sinaloa Federation, Federación de Sinaloa where the Juarez cartel leader was the Beltran Leivas and all the stuff. And even since then, they've been trying to cut deals or they've been cutting deals with the DA. They, I guess the DA is um, eager to keep arresting kingpins and busting drug lo loads, um, that they break deals with them. But these Mexican narcos at the same time, they are so naive that they think that they're gonna actually benefit from that, you know, that they're gonna leave off of that of that deal. Um, El Vicentillo is uh, is the son of El Mayo Zambada, which allegedly is the leader of the Sinaloa cartel right now. Um, after they arrested El Chapo, the only one there is only one picture of him, and no one knows where the fuck he is, is El Mayo Zambada. 
So supposedly he's the boss of the Sinaloa cartel. Although you and I know they don't work like that anymore. But he's somewhat like a figure, you know, like a respected figure. Uh, he's been hiding forever. There's only one picture of him taken by this uh, Mexican magazine, Proceso, because the director of that magazine interviewed him uh, a while ago. Um, and El Vicentillo is his hun son, and he tried in 2000, they, they don't really say when, but it's between 2010 and 2012, he tried to break a deal with the DA in Mexico City. He got in touch with the DA and he's like, all right, this is my proposal. I'm gonna give you guys intel on the other cartels so you can arrest like all other, but you let me work uh, freely. And the DA is like, yeah, let's do that, man. All right, sounds good. All right, deal, deal, all right, bye-bye. They left, and as soon as he left, he got arrested and extra into the US. So he's, he's recently free. He walked out recently because he snitched on his own dad, on El Mayo Zambada. He called him from prison. He, um, he, he broke a deal with the DA, with the US government, to snitch on the whole Sinaloa cartel. That's, wow. what, that's what got El Chapo arrested, like that guy snitching on the whole organization. He's free. Obviously, the US recommended him not to go back to Mexico. No one knows where he is. Of course, I don't think it's a good idea for him to go back to Mexico. Um, but he might be operating again. He might be back at it again somehow with his dad or not. Who knows? The thing is, I learned that these deals have been going on still with the Sinaloa cartel, with some other members, with some other people. And now the Jalisco Nueva Generación, which is the ruthless cartel growing up, and it's huge. His financial reach is three times more than the Sinaloa cartel. It's just huge. Wow. Now they're trying to break a deal with the DEA. Now they're meeting DEA agents. Now they are saying, like, we can get you El Mayo, we can get you this and that from Sinaloa Cartel um, if you let us walk free. And I don't know, I'm not sure, I can't confirm for a fact, but for what they say, the Jalisco, it's working. They say, like, the deal is working, man. The deal is ongoing. That's how we're getting shit tons of firearms like we've never seen before. They just recently posted a video on social and it's a full army. They have tanks, they have this kind of like rhinos, mm -hmm. like armored vehicles. Yeah. They have uh, like rocket launchers, they have um, RPGs. They have like... <clears throat> um, so you're saying that the DEA is trading weapons for... Kingpins, for info. Kingpins. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and not only that, I also know that they've been, well, not specifically the DA, but the DA is in the middle of that. Um, the U.S. government has been giving out um, green cards to some of them, some of the cartel members, some of the people who is on the record killing more than 20, 30, 40 people in Mexico. And they're giving out green cards in the middle of, of a moment where there are a lot of people from Latin America trying to desperately enter the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they're stuck in places like Juarez. The U.S. is giving out green cards to narcos uh, in exchange for something so shitty as um, a statement uh, in court where it's all fixed. That They say like the exact same thing. Do you know that guy? Yes. Can you point where the narco whatever is? He's that guy. Was he the leader of the organization? He was. He Did he um, ask you to, you know, uh, traffic drugs? Yeah, he did. All right. There you have Green card for you, your wife, your kids, and some money. Wow. <laughs> it's like, dude, that's so unfair. That's so, that's a policy that is not only unfair, but it's also unethical, you know, on, on Mexico. Have you uh, personally witnessed any of that? Yes, I personally witnessed that, yes, uh, on a court uh, in El Paso, on one of the allegedly um, leaders of the Juarez cartel. I personally saw that. I personally t spoke with a lawyer who showed me the deals 
um, the U.S. government was breaking on that case, and who these people were on the organization of Juarez. I even saw the um, record of statements they did. And at the beginning they said like, this is not that guy. And then it's like, and it's like, no, this is, yeah, it is that guy. Like they did the wrong statement and someone told them like, that's the wrong statement. You need to say that's the guy. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, this is the guy. And they're getting green cards. Wow. It's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy how they are operating. Or honestly, it's not, it's not news why the U.S. is having a backlash, you know, on a bunch of people from Mexico, Central America, South America, arriving at the border, desperate, asking for help. It's, it's backlash of some of the, those policies where you protect narcos, you know, for your own good, for your mm -hmm. own benefit. Uh, but this protects a lot of people. Do you think there may be some things that you might be missing? as far as what the government's doing to these guys, maybe they give them a green card, but maybe they're also turning them into an informant, you know, keeping them going, still running them as an asset, and cool continuing to get information out even though they're in the U.S.? Cool be, man, cool be, because, I mean, I, there's another story I, uh, I published in 2013, I think, uh, on the guy who delivered El Chapo, was a doctor. Uh, he didn't have any relationship with the uh, with, uh, cartels. He just happened to live in Ciudad Juarez and had a neighbor who was the right arm in the state for El Chapo. He got into some kind of fight with him. He threatened his wife and his kids. So he decided to snitch on him on an international bridge. Um, he arrived at an international bridge. He's like, hey, I know a guy who works very high up in the Sinaloa organization. So they were like, yeah, whatever, just get the fuck out, <laughs> you know? And then he called 911 and he like tried hard. He went to the Mexican um, government, military. No one will, will believe him. And then he said, he arrived to the US consulate in Juarez saying that he had a bomb on him. So they grabbed him, took him in, and it was like, no, I don't have a bomb. So they searched him and like read like his background and whatever. It's so like, then what the fuck are you doing here? It's like, oh, I have some information that I want to tell you. And uh, so he started like sharing, like this guy th does this and that. And he's like the right arm is he's in charge of all of this stuff and all that shit. So they arrested that guy. Um, they went for him in a hotel in Juarez when he arrived with his wife, like he just like stepped out of his car and someone arrived behind him. It's like, hey, let's go, get up. And he's like, oh shit, I don't know if this is cartel or government. <laughs> so he just went up the, the car. And I know that because of the, a source in the Interpol described me the whole operation to get that guy. And, um, and he's like, he didn't put any resistance, he just got up the van. And then he asked like, who is this? And he's like, it's the US government. He's like, oh my God, yeah, thank God. <laughs> so they took him, they took this doctor into the US and uh, gave him protection, another identity, an S visa, which it's a visa for stitch, basically. Uh, but then they told him, like, do you have any more information uh, you can share with us? And he's like, no, man, I'm not inside the cartels. And he's like, okay, if you don't have more information, we're going to revoke your S visa, because that's only for these purposes. And you're going to go back to Mexico. So he was, like, super desperate. That's where he called me. That's where he's like, dude, I'm desperate. Um, I gave this all information to those guys and I don't know what to do and I wanted to reach out to the media. So I started, started following his story and in the middle of that story he managed to find or to get the phone number of a woman who was with El Chapo at all times. Um, and he said like, this is her phone number, uh, I'm, I'm handing it to the DA, the DA knows where she is, where El Chapo is and that's how El Chapo got arrested the first time he, mm -hmm. he got arrested. Um, even then, they still threatened this guy to send him back to Mexico. They're like, okay, what else? And he's like, I just gave you a chapel, man. Like, this was your operation. This was not a Mexican operation. And he's like, all right, but what else do you have to keep your ass visa, you know? So he felt like he was disposable. Like, he was totally disposable. Like, I'm, I'm an informant, I'm giving out you know, like good information, they should just leave me alone. 
um, but they didn't. And I know he's hiding still from the DEA, <laughs> from the narcos inside yeah. the U.S. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you can't blame him. You yeah. Know, if he's got information, it's going to save lives. Yeah. You know, and uh, we just went through, you know, that some Mexicans are pissed off because arms are being tracked, trafficked down there, mm -hmm. you know, from the U.S. Well, now you have a guy who has a ton of information and, you know, yeah. Yeah, and I information feel information could save a lot of lives. Exactly. And I know? feel that my responsibility in all that is to shed light into how stuff really works, yeah. not talking points, not blaming governments, yeah. not blaming whatever policies. It is what it is. It's like, this is how There's it works. Information. Exactly. This is how it works. Yeah. It's not structure. It's not an evil plan from the U.S. like flew Mexico with fucking guns and they kill each other. Yeah. This is how it's going on. There's people making money out of it, especially in the, during the pandemic, you know? Yeah. I appreciate that. Everybody has to put a spin on shit these days. And, yeah. You know, you can't just present information anymore. But it's, it, you're still doing it. That's, that's awesome. But... Yeah. <laughs> a lot of stuff going on down there, man. And yeah. it's... Um, Trying to, I'm trying to find the ties that ties us, you know, the U.S. and Mexico. I live at the border. I'm a border um, kid. Um, so I live, I, I report in Spanish, write in English. I meet people like you. I interview people like you in English and report in Spanish. Back and forth all the time. Back and forth all the time. And I receive the heat from both sides. I, I receive the heat from Mexico because I write in English. And they say, like, oh, you're a fucking sellout. And I received the hit from the U.S. because I report and write Spanish. It's like, oh, you fucking Mexican. You're just like just talking bullshit about the U.S. and Mexico. And I received the hit from Trump supporters and from Biden supporters. And yeah. I received the hit from Mexican President AMLO supporters and the opposition. I received the hit from everybody because I'm not in the business of putting out my opinion. Yeah. You know? I'm in the business of showing things as they are. And yeah. some things are good about Trump. Some things are bad about Trump. Some, team, some team, things are good about Biden. Some teams are, things are bad about Biden. Um, it's just the way things are, you know, like, because yeah. I'm not trying to put the nice light on any president or on any government. I'm yeah. trying to, to tell it how it is and not put my voice in it. Just say, like, I went there, talked to these people, and this is how it works. Yeah. You know, that's it. I appreciate that. I really do. <laughs> Thanks, man. But do um, you have anything else you want to talk about when it comes to the arms deals? I think I think that's that's pretty much pretty much it, man. Perfect. Let's take another break and then let's get into some drugs. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> let's get into some fentanyl. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of went through some of the arms trafficking and some of the deals that you were a part of, not a part of, were able to report on, <laughs> and uh, big correction there. <laughs> yeah, it's like, a, don't, don't, don't mix, don't put me into the mix, you know? <laughs> I have the ATF stand outside the door waiting for <laughs> It's like, no, 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 it's like, <laughs> but, you're, um, you're on the record. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but you also uh, recently went and you were able to report on and actually go into a lab that was making fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So where was that? We got some great videos uh, that you gave us that we're going to put in here. So uh, while we're talking about this, you'll be seeing photographs and videos of the actual lab. But yeah. 
go ahead and and let's hear what you got. So, so was fentanyl started like ramping in the U.S. You know, like being like a proper issue. I I also wanted to know where to where does it start. You know, like where where is it being made and how and who is making it. Uh, I reached out to one of my sources in Sinaloa, of course, like this guy who always like comes through, and um, and I asked him if I could be on on a fentanyl lab, and he told me it was kind of hard because the fentanyl labs now they're not set up as before. Before they will they will like rent or buy a warehouse and mm -hmm. establish an ongoing lab, but because of the busts. The Mexican government has been busting um, labs. They are making like these small labs on the go in the middle of nowhere, and they work quick overnight, take everything, destroy the rest, and leave. And they're gone. And they're gone. <clears throat> so I told him like, I know it sounds like um, like a letter to Santa Claus, but I wanted to ask you if we can actually follow the whole process. Like, if you find that someone's gonna be cooking. I want to know, I want to be there for the preparation, like how they set up, you know, for, for that. And he's like, you're asking for too much because it's not like, obviously they don't share, they don't announce like, okay, we're going to set up a fucking fentanyl lab, you know? <laughs> so, so, so it's like, so it's going to be hard. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go down to Culiacán and um, wait there for your signal, you know? So I did. Culiacán is a beautiful city, man. You you really have to go there. <laughs> it's a nice city, um, nice weather, nice um, people, uh, nice places to eat, uh, great seafood. So I spent a couple of days just eating seafood, having beers, and walking and swimming at the hotel pool until I got the signal from this guy that said, like, all right, I'm picking you up at the hotel, and we're driving off to the outskirts of Culiacán, in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, okay, I'll follow, follow your lead. Um, he knows me and he knows that I don't go without like a safety protocol. So I just jumped in um, and we started like driving, taking off. And I, st I asked him like, can I start recording from now? And um, he said, no, 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 no. No, because the, um, the road might be, um, you know, like someone kind of knows where we are or where we're headed. So no road at all. And I'm like, okay. I was with a, with a film crew uh, for Vice World News. So there was a cameraman, a host, and I told the cameraman, like, just don't, because he's a white, um, almost reddish, uh, British guy. He doesn't look like he belongs super, in Mexico. No, super okay. tall. And I was like, just don't dress. Um, dangerously, you know, <laughs> just dress. Don't do anything stupid. Exactly. Like if you dress, uh, I don't know, like hipster e, yeah. then you're good. You know, if you dress like a skateboarder, you're good. Whatever. Just don't dress in a dangerous way. I guess he didn't understand what a dangerous way was because he was full on DA agent. You know, like oh man, khaki cargo pants. Like oh. this black tactical boots, sort of like short boots, not the long boots. Glasses, you know, like these kind of like dark glasses. Um, a green uh, military cap and a backpack. And I'm like, dude, really, you all did yourself today. <laughs> you don't even dress like that on a regular basis, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, all right, so let's go. Uh, uh, let's hope that's not going to be an issue. And he was like super worried about that. He's like, do you really feel that I just can jump out and just don't go. And I'm like, no, man, you have to go. You're the camera operator, so let's go. Um, we went there. Uh, we arrived into a, like a very small town, like dirt roads and everything. And from there, we met another guy, another couple of guys, grab a pickup truck, put us in the back, and started like driving off in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere. So it was like really in the middle of the woods. And then from there, we met another guys on motorcycles, and they started driving the motorcycles into the woods, and we started walking until they found a place where they have um, taken out like a lot of uh, trees, and they started setting up a lab right there. Um, 
some of the stuff it's in the pictures I, I send you, like this huge, um, I don't know, like barrels or something like that. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, precursors, a lot of chemicals, a lot of uh, like a stove, like a man-made stove, uh, and a, um, like a small roof, you know, like a, like a tent. And um, and I obviously we obviously had uh, masks on, like ma not like the regular face mask, like proper um, gas masks. Mm -hmm. um, but those guys didn't have anything, like anything. And there was like an old guy, and it's like okay, he's the cook. Um, or boss brought someone from China to to teach him how to cook this shit. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And it's like, how many people knows that? And it's like, just like a couple, just like two guys in the organization can know how to properly cook. Um, and I'm like, okay. And then I started like talking to him. He's like very quiet. He didn't really want to talk. He was like too shy with the camera. Is, was the man from China on in the lab? Or no, he I, had come in and taught a, a group of people how to do this? Apparently he just uh, uh, teach that guy and that, that guy showed another guy. Um, and then apparently what goes on is like they had to show or to teach another two guys in case they die. There's another two guys, but it's just like pairs of two um, keep learning about how to cook. But it was just once where the Chinese came and showed this guy how to properly cook fentanyl. Um, and the, uh, the fentanyl, like the proper um, powder, like fentanyl in powder, the precursors to cook it, come from China or from Germany. And really? they really take care of that shit, like if that was cold. They bring him in in a box with one, one arm guy, and he's always looking at that bag. And he's always like, okay, that's too much, don't, don't waste it, put it back, lock it in. And that guy's always like taking care of that stuff, like the, the precursors. Fentanyl is possibly the most addictive drug on the planet. Yes, exactly, it's an opioid. An opioid. Um, and it's 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 a pandemic in the U.S. now because it's uh, it's really hurting bad. Like not only there are people you know like drug addicts or people in the street, but also moms, dads, working people, regular people. Um, it's killing a lot of people because a lot of drugs are being laced with uh, fentanyl. Mm -hmm. um, and those guys, it's that's what amazed me. While they were cooking, while they were like setting up, I was asking like. How do you move from one business to another? How do you move from cooking heroin to lace it with fentanyl? How do you move from that to pure fentanyl? How do you move from that to meth? You were like dealing with marijuana not long ago. And one of those guys was like telling me like if it was like a proper established business, you know, it's like our clients in the US, they tell us, they started like, they started telling us, that the heroin we were giving them wasn't strong enough. So we had some small drops of fentanyl into that, and they liked it. But a year went by, and they're like, it's not strong enough. So we added some more. And now we're adding like a lot. So like this cold kill a huge animal, you know? And they're, they're liking it, they're liking it. We're getting good feedback from our users. And like you have like a feedback system on how to make drugs? How? Like, did you, like, someone calls you or your boss or whatever? And it's like, no, no, no. Like, the, the street vendors, um, when they're selling, they're like, eh, hey, you know what? It's not selling good because my client says that there's an, a stronger heroin around the corner with the old guys. So we need to bring this one stronger. So he says, the guy he buys from, and that guy from the guy he buys from, and and he goes all the way back to that cooker, you know, to the interesting to the cook. And um, so yeah, it's like I just received the orders. Like, put more fentanyl into that heroin. It's not strong enough now, and he does. I always wondered. I I thought it was a little counterproductive to make the drug so strong because so many people are dying, but. Now I understand if it's immediate feedback from the users to the cookers. Then exactly. Yeah, because it, it wouldn't make sense. Like, that's what I understand. That like, okay, so these guys, yeah, because it wouldn't make sense for these guys to be killing 
their clients in the US, you know? Um, it wouldn't make sense like for them to be actually like, yeah, just have it like super strong so they fucking die or not overdose. They know that and they talk about that. And so like, we don't use this shit. That we don't, we don't use any of this shit. It's, that's, that's fucking strong. Those guys are crazy. And I'm like, you guys are cooking it. You guys are crazy. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but we don't use that. Like those guys are asking for stronger shit every time, wow. more and more. And I'm like, but they're dying. And it's like, I know, but that's what they want. If they want to kill themselves, that's on them. I'm getting paid to cook. And I'm like, wow, that's, that was revealing, you know? That was like really something, like how they actually see the issue. Because we think, we tend to think that these guys are like the bad guys, you know, like putting fentanyl and cooking and say like, yeah, they're gonna die in the US. They're actually like, wow, that's strong. I don't know if they should be using this shit, you know? Um, and they, so they lace a bunch of stuff, um, chloride or I don't know, like a bunch of stuff they put into that mix. And then they start, you know, like just mixing it but you get the fumes, and they're like strong fucking fumes. I, I, I was wearing one of those masks, and I mean, it was, it was awful, it was bad. I you could, could still feel, smell it. You could still smell it, you could still feel, you know, the, the trees around the area were all dead, like around that specific area. They were all like from dry. The, from, the from the fumes, mm -hmm. yeah, like speci in a specific circle, all dead, like all fucking brown, dead, no Freeze. shit. I thought that was just the environment when I was looking at the no, videos. Those, oh, yeah, the exactly. Photos. Yeah, you'll see that. Uh, don't, no, there's not like that. They're, they're all dead. They're all dead. It's only around that. You walk like a couple of feet from there and it's green. Again, like green leaves, healthy trees. Wow. But it's that strong. It's that crazy. And that's for a couple of batches only. How much, how much fentanyl does a couple of batches look like? Is it, is it, well, while they were cooking there, they used the bag of the precursor to make fentanyl was a bag like that, um, filled up to the middle. And they used like a corner of that, you know, like shh. The rest was a lot of other shit with heroin and I don't know what. And then they make this, this paste. Um, when they cook it, they, 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 they cook the whole, um, like a broth. And then they leave it to dry. Um, and then when it's dry, it's like a, it's like a paste, like a brownish paste. And they told me that the quantity they used um, into that of the precursors were worth like 200 bucks, 300 bucks, something like that. And what it was in the bag, by, for when, when it was dry, in Mexico, it was like 20 grand. And in the US, it was like, 100, 120, 200 grand. So he's like, we have a lot of money here. And I'm like, shit. And I was like, so what if the government comes like right now? So like, we just like burn everything and just grab the gold. You know, just this, this is the worth. The, the precursor and this shit, let's go. Everything else, just like burn it. Um, they took me to another place around, all burn out. And I was like, did they, yeah, like someone told us, like, hey, the military is on, on its way, so we had to burn everything. Grab the shit and go. And uh, we were gonna make the double, like twice the batch we did there, but we only managed to do one before they came. So that's where we're cooking this second batch to make it for that. And I'm like, okay, and then from here, what's, what's next? And it's like from here, uh, the boss shows up. Apparently the boss is, is, was the brother of the of the old cook, um, and he's like, yeah, my, my brother, he's like very intelligent, man, not like me, I'm only a cook, and I love marijuana, I love to harvest marijuana, have a beautiful, beautiful um, crop of beautiful weed, man, good quality, all natural, I wanna show, he was like so proud of his weed crop, but um, he didn't like working into that, but I was paying the bills, you know, it's like, yeah. and he felt like he was supporting his brother, He's like, my brother came out with this idea, like, okay, we can cook this shit, I can find the proper, um, a proper supplier in China. I'm gonna bring it, you're gonna cook it, I'm gonna export it, and we're gonna make shit tons of money. 
And I was like, is he? And he was like, yeah, he's just making shit tons of money. Like, because he doesn't take it all the way to the US. What he yeah. does is he sells it to someone he doesn't even know. But uh, there's a, trans a transport in the middle who just, he just pays that. Like, okay, um, I'm gonna send this quantity of fentanyl to the US. All right, it's gonna be 2,000 grand. And he takes um, requests from everybody. So he carries a um, Cessna or a car, it depends, with a lot of uh, drugs from different narcos. You know, it's like have this meth. That's why they, they were like putting a name on the on the badge. Oh shit! So he's delivering to all the cartels. So the delivery guy is like, okay, yeah, I'm taking from Sinaloa to the border. That's not the cook though. That's no, the that's transporter. The just, he just cooks, and okay. then he gets everything ready. His brother arrives, takes the badge already in bricks to the cook. I mean to the delivery guy. Um, all branded. It's like, okay, it's like six bricks of this shit under my name. Off you go. There's your money. And he's like, okay, I have a trip to Mexicali. Who else is gonna send me shit? Uh, wow. And then another guy jumps in and says, like, I have like some meth, I have some coke, I have some weed. There you go. So these cooks, do they have direct ties to the cartels? Or is it direct tie to the transporter who has direct ties to the cartels? That's exactly what I was telling you before on the on the how the structure works now this guy represents a cartel but it's like a brand you know it's like if you open up a shop of nike tennis uh, uh, sneaker shoes here you're not necessarily part of the nike corporation you know you have a store selling that brand so these guys are representing a brand but not a cartel it's a franchise. It's a franchise. So these guys are like, okay, I get the protection from the cartel. They are allowing me to cook here. They are giving me some assets. Um, and I am delivering drugs for them. You know, only my, my job is to cook and to send. So that's an, ex that's a, that's an extremely small operation. Yes. So how are they making connections with the Chinese? to come over and teach them how to cook if it's such a small organization, Through such the a cartel. small outfit. That's where the, the big organization comes in, you know, like the big bosses or like the big people. They the facilitate cartel. it. Exactly, like this guy, the brother of the cook, he knew a guy from the Sinaloa cartel higher up, dealing with money laundering, like higher operations, you know, like um, arms trafficking. It was uh, trafficking Chinese into Mexico uh, with um, fake Mexican IDs. And that was the deal. Like, okay, you give me precursors, I'll bring your, I'll smuggle your people into my country. You know, so they're bringing Chinese with precursors into Mexico, and it's wow. <laughs> it's a whole fucking operation, man. So he knew that guy, and he's like, hey, man, my brother can cook, I can like, you know, operate that part of the business, and um, I'll just be selling you the batches. What do you think? And he's like, yeah, that's a good idea. All right, I'm gonna bring out uh, a cook from China knows how to cook that shit it's gonna show you uh, and you and you start and start selling me that those, those batches and wow. it's like yeah let's set it up so they set up that cook that kitchen how that, many of these little if you have an estimation that'd be great if not that's labs? fine too but yeah these little labs do there are Thousands, like, millions. I, I, get, I, I guess like it, only in the outskirts of Culiacan, you can count them by the hundreds every day. Every day. Like How every many? Day, by the hundreds. By the hundreds? By the hundreds. Like 100, something, labs. 200, 300 labs working at the same time. Wow. And then disappearing. And then the next day popping up somewhere different. And then disappearing and then popping up somewhere different. They're cooking this every day? Every single day. How long does it take them? Um, we arrived there around 11 in the morning or so, and we left by 6-ish p.m. before sunset. So around like six, seven hours to cook like okay. a batch that worth 200K in the U.S. So like that. So every six hours? They're like, again. They're producing $100,000 worth of fentanyl. <clears throat> uh -huh. And um, the cook was telling me that the another set of cooks recently died. It's like, they die, like, if they don't 
if they don't, because he wasn't talking. He wasn't like, he was like super quiet. But then someone offered him uh, Coke. And then he started like talking. We actually were like cranking when we were like editing the video. Um, the, the, the vice crew and I was like just laughing like all through the night because he transformed, you know. He was like super quiet, super not, you know, shy. And then he goes like, so then, yeah, you have to use this shit. So it's, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he started like talking and um, a lot. And so he started talking about his brother, about his crops, about all this stuff, and about how most of the cooks don't last more than two months. They keep dying every two months, so that he has to teach someone else. And then, you know. Why are they dying? Because of the fumes. The poison? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like they, he's like, that's why I use Coke to, to, to balance the effects of the fentanyl. <laughs> oh, man. That doesn't sound, yeah. um, you know, right or wrong. <laughs> I think you got it wrong, man. I don't think the, the cocaine is going to help out it's that you're getting more chemicals into your body and they end up all like cold and, you know, um, affected by the fentanyl. They end up, and they drink a lot. Drink. It's like, you, you gotta you got to keep hydrated, man. That's why we got a bunch of beers and um, bottles of tequila. They had Don Julio right there. It's like drinking Don Julio and beers. And, and the fumes and the coke. It's like, wow, man. You really end up a journey like super intoxicated from here. Damn, mm -hmm. two month like life expectancy for exactly, those guys. yeah. And um, surrounded by a couple of um, armed people that are just there, sitting, bored, talking, drinking. You know, like uh, and when they're over, they just like escort the shit to yeah. where it has to go. Dude, what kind of drugs are the? Are they? They're lacing. What kind of drugs with fentanyl? And can you get just straight fentanyl? Yes, they're doing straight fentanyl, like uh, pills and that kind of shit. Uh, and they're lacing uh, heroin and meth with fentanyl. That's not what. coke? Not coke. Not for what I saw there. Not for what I learned there. They, I don't know. I mean, they might be doing, but when I was there, it was only a batch of heroin, a batch of meth to, to take into the U.S. Mm. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was an interesting... It was very interesting to learn how to... How does that work, you know, how unstructured the organizations are. Um, another guy in Mexicali at the border, uh, we met, we follow the, the route. So we met with the guy in charge of the stash house where that drug was going to be stashed before jumping into the U.S. You and followed the product, we followed the product to the stash house? Uh -huh, to the stash house. And then, I mean, not, not like... That specific product, you just followed a product. No, we we knew where where that was gonna be stashed, so we arrived there two days later. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we went there to that stash house and talked to that guy. So like, okay, so what's the next process of this of this drug? And he's like, right now, what I'm doing is putting everything into Ziplocs, uh, vacuum sealed, and then I wash them with um, uh, detergent, you know, to like. This suavitel, it's called in Mexico, to, for it, to, so it smells like roses and the dogs wouldn't smell it. And when he's all washed up, um, we're going to put it in, um, in a car that is going to arrive here. And all right, so, and then in the middle of the interview and everything, uh, um, a couple, like a man and a woman, like nicely dressed in a nice car, showed up to that fucking stash house. And they were like very curious, like, who are these guys with cameras here? And it was like, oh, it's, a, it's an interview. They're reporters from the U.S. And they were like, can we stay here a little? And they were like having fun watching us, taking us pictures. And then they went into our room and then they left. And I was like, who's these people? It was like, oh, they are the um, launderer, launderers. Uh, they came here to deliver some stacks of bugs. We count them with a the machine stashed them and they left mm -hmm. and I'm like oh wow that's interesting too <laughs> and I'm like all right so and then what you do so it's like okay we're, we're gonna wait wait for the car it's like okay is, is that like a uh, part of the cartel car someone it's like no 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 the borders are closed for most Mexican residents so we're exclusively using US citizens like the people who is out of work we started recruiting them recruiting them in the US like hey do you want to make like 500 bucks to a thousand 
in um, an afternoon. And um, some, some of them say, yes, all right, okay. So you just show up in Mexicali and um, we'll, um, we'll, you know, like have a load on your car. You're not, we're not going to tell you where it is. Uh, and then you're going to deliver that, leave the cars, leave the keys of your car in the parking lot. We're going to take it. We're going to get back. And you're good to go. Um, so that afternoon, uh, a woman arrived, a um, woman speaking perfect English. She was from California um, in a Mercedes, uh, old Mercedes Benz. And um, she was like, yeah, I've been doing this for a good while. And I'm like, why? She's like, I have five kids. Um, I'm out of job because of the pandemic. And someone offered me this job. So, yeah, I make two or three trips a day. Wow. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And how come they don't, I don't know, they don't stop you at the border? And she's like, because I, I, even, even the days I don't carry loads, I still cross. Because my story is I work in Mexico and I live in the U.S. She's, so, so She's made a cover story. Mm-hmm. Sticks to it. Exactly. She's created an entire pattern of life. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we followed her. Uh, they put the stuff in her car. We followed her, and she got secondary. <laughs> she got what? Secondary. Um, oh. She was like a secondary um, inspection when they send you to these booths, and they put like x-rays and dogs, and the CBP officers, the customs are like looking all over your car. They didn't find anything. Nothing. They, nothing. Nothing. That was like... We thought like, oh shit, they got her. And no, we met her at a, at a, at a motel, on the other side. And we were like, what the fuck, you just got secondary. She was like, yeah, honestly, I thought I was like done, but I didn't find anything. And I'm wow. like, wow, that's fucking crazy. It was like, are you afraid? She's like, yeah, every time is the last time. Every time I do this is the last time I'm gonna do it. And, uh, but I can't stop because it's good money and I yeah. don't have any other uh, source of income. So I don't know if that, that when the pandemic uh, restrictions are lifted, I don't know if she actually got a proper job and got out of that. Wow. Hopefully. What would happen to you guys if you were at that uh, fentanyl lab? And <clears throat> I don't think anything because um, we're, not, we're not carrying anything with us. We're not being part of the operation, the business. We are just filming there. Um, I guess what will happen is they might be interested in talking to us to see if we can snitch, say something, locations, names. But um, other than that, um, I don't think there's, uh, there's anything they could actually do to us. You know? um, when we had to take a flight from LA, well, I had to take a flight from, from LA I ditched all of my clothes into the trash bin because it smells so strong of, I don't know, ugly. It smells yeah. like super fucking strong. So I put everything in the trash and uh, I was like, yeah, I'm ready to fly back again home, you know, because this, <laughs> this stinks and I'm tired and it was like intense, you know, it was like you have to be on top of your mind all the time, like on top of everything, on top of a production and also on top of the safety of yourself and everybody else and your, and your crew, you know, because one guy was from Brazil, the other guy was from Colombia, the other guy was from the UK. Um, when we crossed the border, the officer was like, what is this, like a fucking UN car? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was, it was like a Mexican and Brazilian, a guy from the UK and a Colombian in the same car. It's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Damn, that's interesting. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. It was, it was very interesting. It was a, it was a nice access. It was an interesting access um, into how does that um, work? Works, you know. Yeah. And and what it's doing to killing some lives in the U.S. Many lives, and getting some people alive, like that girl, like providing for her family, for her kids. Yeah. It's what is all this going to be made into? It's a documentary, which is all, already in um, Vice World News. Um, I'll show you the link. What's it called? It's called, 
can't remember. It's called something like it's a short documentary called how the U.S. No, how Mexican cartels are using U.S. citizens to smuggle drugs or something like very newsy. Oh, okay. You know, it's like a it's like a report. You know, not, not like a proper full on documentary. It's like a 10, 10 15 minutes piece. Okay. Mm-hmm. For Vice World News. Yeah, I'd love to watch it. I'd love to see. Yeah, the, I'll, the I'll definitely send you the link. And um, it's interesting. We embedded with the Mexican police. Because we know that Mexicali is huge for um, labs. They denied everything. They said, like, no, nope, there is actually no labs here, man. Like, uh, this is one of the cleanest city in terms of lab operations. We obviously didn't say, like, we've just been into one. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, really? No shit. It's like, yeah. And it's just like, he kept talking and talking. And like, so then what are we doing? Because we discussed, like, you were going to go into a, an operative and we kind of met with you. It's like, yeah, we have an operative, um, permanent operatives going through the city to find, you know, stuff. And I was like, okay, so we spend four hours finding people with a small weed cigarette. <laughs> it's like, stop right there, <laughs> you look suspicious. And they were like, bah, bah, bah. and it was like, okay, so these guys are just putting up a show for the cameras. Yeah. We're gonna cut all that out, because this is bullshit, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. It was, it was interesting to, to be in that place. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Let's take another quick break. Let's do it. Louise, I kind of want to wrap this interview up, but you've taken part in quite a few documentaries, and and um, I kind of want to what what are those documentaries? I want to link them below sure. uh, so people can kind of see your work and what you've been involved in. So definitely. So um, I've been working for some documentaries in Vice World News. Um, I'll share you the link so you can put them out there. Mostly like re- reporting on 10, 15 uh, uh, minute pieces. Like a um, mini docs? Yeah, like mini docs on, on the beats I cover. Um, for CNN, I did like some, some interesting stuff with a, with a smuggler, with a human smuggler. He allowed us to follow him all through from his safe house to the border wall until he put people together and why is he doing it, how much is charging. Um, also, I've been doing some more like blown um, version documentaries like the one um, on, show, on Showtime. It's called Ready for War. Um, on deported veterans uh, who end up working for cartels in Mexico, and um, um, and and some series like um, Dope in Netflix, the Mexican part of that series, I, I've helped um, produce that. I'm, uh, I'm in the middle of uh, uh, production for two short documentaries for Vice as well. One on um, weaponized drones um, in Mexico, the cartels are weaponizing drones, <coughs> and the other one about how the um, Mexican drug traffickers, specifically the Sinaloa cartel, is using uh, Mexican indigenous people to run drugs across the border in um, long desert stretches. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a lot so, of stuff you're involved in. That's a lot in. of stuff, yeah. <laughs> what would the one that you're probably most, do you have one that you are most proud of? Um, I mean, it, it depends, because every time I, I jump into a new project, uh, that's the one that I'm most excited uh, about. So right now, the uh, indigenous issue, I'm very, very excited about that one because it's been a story that I've been hearing and covering for a while now. Uh, I just did a story on that, um, a written story, talking to some of them, talking, reviewing court documents on their arrests, talking to some of the bad guys and some of the good guys on what's going on with these indigenous people and why are they running drugs and how climate change is a big part of it. 
Um, and so that becoming a docu a short documentary, I'm really excited about that one. To be Interesting. Mm -hmm. How can people find you? Um, I'm very active in Twitter and on Instagram. Um, in Twitter, you can find me as Luis, L-U-I-S, Kuriaki, K-U-R-I-K-Y. I'll share you my handle so you can like, post it here because it might be difficult to remember, Luis Kuriaki. Um, in Instagram, I'm the same, Luis Kuriaki. Um, I go by that name on, my, on most of my social. Just, I, I thought at the beginning, I thought it was um, safety wise, sir, you know, like, I thought that if you look for Luis Chaparro on social media, uh, it's gonna be harder to, to find me, unless you know my handle, which is Luis Kuriaki, you know. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very active on both of them. Um, most of the time when I'm out, um, I record short clips of what I'm reporting, of what I'm doing, uh, when I'm not compromising a location. Uh, and then I upload stories on my Instagram afterwards when I'm back into a safe place, uh, um, home or else. And uh, I start like, so you can know what I'm working um, during that and have some behind the scenes on going to fentanyl labs, armed trafficking stuff. Uh, and also on my Instagram, all my pictures, I, I, they're not like pictures um, of me or selfies or, you know, food. It's pictures of my work, pictures of uh, art people, um, uh, cartels, um, drug king, kingpins, um, pictures that I, most of them might take them or I find them through a source, like the wedding of El Chapo, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. like, so that kind of stuff you can find on my Instagram and, um, and on my Twitter you can find all of my stories. Uh, every time I publish a new story, it's, um, it's on Twitter. Perfect, well, and, I'll be uh, following you. And uh, I just wanna let you know, um, if you ever have anything new, yeah. you're always welcome here. We'd love to get you back on and, and uh, see what you got going on. And if you ever need anybody down there, even if it's just a sound guy, I can hold a boom pole like nobody's business. So that's, I'd love to get down there and take part in that. But. That'll be amazing, man. That'll be that'll be great. That'll be an honor, and, um, and I'm very uh, happy to be here because I watch your show. I learn a lot on your show, and, and so I really wanted to to be here and share uh, my small part of the world that I know, you know, which is the Mexican cartels. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And it's been it's been a real pleasure to host you. So thank you. Be safe down there and uh, best of luck to you. Thank hopefully you. We'll see you around. Thanks a lot. And um, and yeah, and hopefully peop your your people will um, will learn about these guy I'm going to interview soon. And it's going to be uh, around there. <laughs> they will. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.